Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are in the world. And for those that haven't met me before, I'm Mark Callister. I'm the senior partner for Holborn Assets based in sunny Cape Town, South Africa. Uh, today, we will be guiding you through the uh, topping up of state pension contributions or national insurance contributions. Uh, hence our title, Don't Get Your Nicks in a Twist. Um, if you need my contact details, feel free to uh, use any of the information that you see on screen here now. Um, and I look forward to guiding you through the process through the rest of today's webinar. Um, the structure of today's presentation, I'm going to go through a quick introduction on what is a UK state pension, just touching on the different types of, of pensions and what they actually do, how you actually check what you're entitled to, the process of topping up those NICs uh, from abroad, and then lastly, a few little bits on the taxation of UK pensions, particularly for clients that are in South Africa. We've got a lot of people on the call that have a South African UK co uh, connection. And we have a fantastic bit of good news that you may or may not have heard uh, that could save you a fortune. So don't uh, don't shoot off the call until you've heard it all the way to the end, if that, if that applies to you. Um, and just our free pension MOT service um, at the very end. OK, if uh, you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask them along the way. There is a Q&A button at the centre of the screen. So just click on that, type in your question as you think of it. And what I'll do is I'll gather them all together with the webinars team and try and answer them as best I can uh, when we get to that stage. Okay, a little bit about us. Um, so those who haven't come across Holborn before, uh, we've been around for well over 20 years now. Uh, we are um, uh, uh, we're founded in the UAE. Uh, now we run over $3 billion um, across the group. We've got clients in over 30 countries offices in over 11 of those, over 2,000 happy client reviews on Trustpilot. Feel free to, to check that out. Um, and what do we do? Well, we help with all sorts of financial planning solutions, which I'll talk about in a minute. Though I'm based in South Africa, uh, my colleagues and I will be able to assist you wherever you are in the world with these kind of inquiries and much more besides. So what is a UK pension? Well, a pension, for those that don't know, is a tax-efficient vehicle designed to help you grow and protect some savings that you have along the way and provide for your retirement. Uh, retirement. Um, you're encouraged to do so through tax incentives so that you aren't a burden on the state. And one of the things that you get along the way, if uh, even if you don't contribute into your own personal pension, is entitlement to a state pension. So if you get the UK state pension, that's kind of base layer. And then what they encourage you to do is save a bit more. And that might be through other types of private pension. So normally those kind of contributes are tax relief going in and then uh, normally taxed on the way out. Um, and those kind of private pensions can provide a pot of cash that you can use at a certain age. Others can provide a regular income throughout your retirement. But again, those are on top of the bit that we're really talking about today, which is the UK state pension. Um, one of the things, again, I'm sorry that this is really South African focused if you're not from the jurisdiction, but did you know uh, that South Africa, you can potentially get all of that pension income tax free? And it's one of the reasons why so many uh, Brits are now no longer retiring to Spain, they're retiring down to South Africa. Um, and I'd love to talk to you a little bit more about that at the end. But uh, let's focus on what we're here to talk about. So. Whilst you're in the UK, it's likely that you will have paid national insurance contributions or NICs whilst you are working. Okay, uh, This will result in a potential entitlement to some form of a UK state pension, but only if you have enough qualifying years. So if you are only there for a year or two, potentially you'll miss out and that money is effectively lost. You may also likely have paid into a private or a workplace pension scheme. And, and after your property, statistically, this is likely to be your sick, second biggest asset that you own. And it's very important that you don't lose track of that. And that's where we often come in. So on that private pension side, um, there's over £19 billion in unclaimed pension pots. Think of all that money that might be sat in the UK, languishing, not doing anything, you might be entitled to it. Um, and that's on top of obviously what we're going to be talking today. Is your UK pension pot missing in action? So if you've got a private pension, 
you know, you might not know if it's there at all. The, the biggest success story I ever ha- had was uh, a number of years ago, found somebody was entitled to a £600,000 pension pot that they didn't know was there. Um, but there might be just a few pounds left behind that you weren't aware of. Why not check to, to find it out? It's better to, to know, be certain rather than be unsure. Okay, so what are the the main types of pensions? Well, the main one we're talking about today is that basic foundation level, the UK state pension provided by Her Majesty, or sorry, His Majesty's Revenue and Customs. I don't think it'll uh, it'll ever stick with me that that's changed now. It's still HM government pension. Uh, There's also defined contributions. So this is uh, often referred to as a money purchase. So it's a pot of money normally used to go and buy things like funds or or shares or what have you, and those grow in value. And then lastly, the final salary or gold-plated defined benefit schemes, um, one of the areas where we often get involved just to assess how solid those schemes are. And there's been a number of uh, pension stories over the years, the likes of BHS uh, pension fund going into the pension protection fund um, and worthwhile just making sure you check in on those private pensions, uh, regardless of, of what we're talking about today. But anyway, let's move on. So what is the uh, UK uh, state pension? Well, there's two types really you need to be aware of. Firstly, the basic state pension, that's payable uh, to men that born before the 6th of April, 1951, or to women before the 6th of April, 1953. And currently in this tax year, the maximum per week is about £156.20. So we're coming across less and less clients that fall into that category because simply the age profile most people these days are born after 1951, and therefore, what you're going to be talking to us about is potentially your new state pension, and that will mean that you'll pay, be paid somewhere in the region £203.85 a week if you're entitled to whole thing currently, and obviously that then rises over a number of years. But what do you need to do to get it? Well, you need to have 35 qualifying years of NICs you know, national insurance contributions. And if you haven't paid all of those, you might get a smaller pro rata amount, okay? One of the things also you need to be aware of is that if you haven't contributed at least 10 years, you might find that you get nothing at all. And that's where this uh, deadline that come uh, come in that's important to talk to. Um, It's in April, 2025 now. Why is it been moved, moved back twice? Well, because HMI, HMRC have suddenly realized what a can of worms it is. This is they've been absolutely inundated uh, with people asking for you know help with this. So that's why the deadline's been pushed back. But it will shut in April 2025. So our message is act now and see if you can't um, handle or deal with the uh, missing years if that's something you think is prudent to do. Um, and I'm going to talk you now through the steps of how that you do that. So first things first, um, that we'll start off with the electronic route of doing that. Um, and this is checking your national insurance record online. This is the easiest way to do it by a country mile. I know that it might be scary. I know a number of you on the call now maybe find technology a little bit more challenging. You know, why can't I just pick up the phone and speak to someone? Why can't I go in and see somebody? Uh, these days, nearly everything on the UK is very online focused. Okay, so I'm going to start with this. I'm going to do the manual bits as well. But really, this is the quickest way to find out, first of all, what are you entitled to? So how do you do it? You go on to www.gov.uk forward slash check hyphen state hyphen pension. There's the web address there. And you click on that link and it'll take you through to a screen that looks like this. Okay. Then if you go down the web page, you'll find a, a green button and that will take you through to the next page. Okay. And this is the bit that normally stumps most people. You will need to have a government gateway ID number. Okay. I'm not going to go through the whole process of registering for a government gateway ID. You need to provide some information like your national insurance number, like your passport. So if you're really unsure about this, maybe speak to a, a family member that can guide you through. But the first thing you need to do is get a government gateway ID number uh, and registered or, or find whatever one you might have registered with before. All the UK government services really run around this government gateway ID. So it's very important that you do this 
to get access to this information online. So that's where you start. Once you've got your government gateway ID number, you log in, it's a 12 character ID and password, and then you'll log in and go through to a, uh, a screen that looks like this. So this is a snapshot of my screen. I've redacted some of the details so you can see what you'll see if you've got it right. Um, it'll show your name. You can click on the link. It'll confirm your national ins insurance number, which should match. Okay. And then it'll tell you that when you can get your state pension and also what the forecast will be, the maximum that you can get, assuming you do everything that's needed from you uh, to achieve it. Okay. If you scroll on down, there's a little bit more detail and it's really, really clear. So, so when I have people ask me, well, look, I don't know what I'm entitled to. Will I get it? Will I won't? It's all here. This, this answers it in a few minutes. Uh, if you've already got a gateway ID number, it will be a few seconds really. Within a minute, you can answer this question yourself and I encourage you to do so. So as you can see here, currently for me, if I do nothing else, I'm going to get a state um, pension of £109.62 a week, as opposed to the full £203.85. Why is that? Well, I haven't worked enough years yet, even though I you know, may look relatively young. Um, I have worked a number of years, but not enough to get a full state pension. I haven't worked for the full 35 years. So I've got to contribute. Okay, so sorry, that's that that bit there shows you what you currently get if you do nothing. So the you know do nothing scenario is highlighted there. And then this box here says, right, Mark, you've got to work or contribute another 17 years worth of NICs before the 5th of April 2048. That's what I've got to go and do. So, and then I would get access to that £204 a year, give or take. And then, you know, obviously that rises with inflation, assuming that I stay. Uh, in the in the UK when I go back, if I go back, there's a few other points on that we can talk about later. So so there's your answer straight away of how close to that goal you are. So that that first bar there really shows you how much you need to start thinking about adding and how many missing years that you have. But it goes further than that. At the bottom of the screen there, you see there's a link that says view your national insurance record. If you click on that, you get this screen, which then shows you year by year what years are full and what years have I not contributed enough? And guess what? You know, I've been in South Africa about seven years now. Um, I did work in uh, other sectors um, previously outside of the UK. So I've got uh, 18 years of full contributions um, and eight years where I have not paid enough thus far. Why? Because I didn't pay my national insurance contributions. So that eight years is what I need to think about tackling. And you might find that you've got a handful of years or a lot of years, but this is where you will find out that information. Okay, there you go. It's really clear, really easy to understand. Okay, there you can see which years as well are not full and you can click on the details on the right hand side for more information, should you wish. So the first thing the first thing that you need to do is start off with finding out how much or how many uh, years you potentially need to contribute to make up your missing contributions. Okay, so that's the electronic easy route. If you really struggle with the government gateway ID or you just don't do computers at all, then there is this more manual option. Okay, and the web address there is is there as well. You can Google it. So you want the uh, the BR19 form for this, okay? And you can download it at that web address you see on screen now, fill it in and send it back, and then they will come back to you. But unfortunately, normally via post. So this is one of the things that for expats, when you're abroad, really, really encourage you to use that online gateway system, because unless you've got a correspondence address in the UK, you may not even hear back on this inquiry if they insist on posting it out to you. So, so that's how you can do it manually. Okay, let's move on. Then once you know how many years that you've got to top up, whether that's through the government gateway ID or whether that's through the manual BR19 form, okay, then you've got to make a decision on topping up your national insurance contributions, okay? You can learn a lot from the government website, okay? There's the link here. 
you can Google it. So uh, Social Security from Abroad, NI38 is the is the guidance document. And you can have a read through there at that web page. It's very long winded. It covers all scenarios, all countries. And that's what can be a little bit daunting for people. So I'm going to try and condense down the main salient points, the main questions that, that people ask me about this. And then we can go from there. So topping up those nicks from abroad. Right. Once you've got your forecast, you can apply to pay that shortfall. This is a key point. You do not need to fund the class three version. Let me repeat that again. You do not need to fund the class three version. The class two voluntary contributions are a quarter of the cost. And as an expat, you can qualify and use class two contributions, not class three. How much of a saving is it? Well, the current cost for each missing year will be £163.80. That's for class two. If you go for class three, you'll pay £824.20 for each missing year. So under no circumstances do you need to or should you, as an expat, be applying to pay class three contributions unnecessarily. Hopefully, I've made that pretty clear. Um, that's something that makes no difference. You get exactly the same state pension entitlement. Obviously, the website will guide you to pay class three by default. So when you fill in the forms, and I'll come on to those in a minute, class two is all that you need to do. Hopefully, that's answered probably the most common question we've had in the feedback session so far. So for every year that you buy back, that will equate to about an extra £7 per week in increase in your pension for life. So the return on investment is phenomenal. You know, it really is great. You know, you look at it, it's, it's going to pay for itself within the first year uh, of operation. OK, um, from April 2025. So this is the deadline point. OK, you will only be able to retrospectively purchase the previous six UK tax year. So from about 2020 onwards. So at the moment, you can buy back any of the missing years. Okay. When we get to 2025, you'll only be able to go back as far as 2020. Okay. So it's really important that you act on this now. Bear in mind the workload that they're under. You need to get this through, get in the front of the queue and get an action if you're going to do it sooner rather than later so that then you're caught up before we get to the 2025 deadline. If you have get gaps before 2016, you need to hurry. The rules are changing in April 2025. And I'll be doing this webinar every, I think we've agreed every quarter to six months, just to remind people that now is the time to act. Please don't leave it to the last minute. We're really, really lucky that they've extended this deadline twice now. But the message is they will not extend it again from April 2025. That's why they've gone that far into the future to allow all of the, the the, the uh, demand, the pent up demand to be cleared. And then that is it. Boom. It's it's stopping at that point. OK, so when you uh, know how many years that you want to uh, contribute for, you need to fill in this form. And this is the CF83 form. OK, um, you can read the uh, contribution uh, or the leaflet in I-38, which I talked about before. The CF83 form is the one that you need to, to fill in. OK, once you fill this in, this is what will determine how you, uh, you know, the reference numbers that you need to be able to make your payments. OK, and this is something you have to do manually. You can't do it on the website. So, so you download this form, fill it in, and then you send it back to HMRC. So CF83, if you're Googling it now, you want the CF83 form from HMRC. Um, if you want, we can email it to you and we'll show you the details as part of this, how you can reach out to us and, and send you all of these guidance. And we'll do a step-by-step -step guide and we'll send it to you um, that makes it easy to, to fill it all in. Uh, let's move on. And then once you've got it completed, you return the completed form to this address, so PT Operations in the north of east of England, and there's all of the details there. And um, obviously, if you're sending it from somewhere like South Africa, we really would encourage you to send that registered post. You know what the postal system is like here. And then you know that it's been received by HMRC and they will act on it. We've, we've had very positive feedback. Um, but if you're not sure, if you really need to pick up the phone, just bear in mind that they are busy. OK, you can phone them from abroad to chat to them. And the number is 0044 1912 037 010. Obviously, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. 
UK time. And that will help you guide you through this process if you're not sure. Okay. Now, one thing that a client has highlighted to us is it appears the response will only come via post. Um, we don't know for definite whether the response will come online. Um, we're waiting to hear on that. So one of the things we recommend wherever possible, um, and this is just general good financial planning for expats, it's what we do all day, every day, is try and retain some form of a UK address where you can have posts sent to so you don't lose out on information from people like HMRC or other you know, providers in, in the UK. So so that's one thing that we encourage is, is have either um, you know, a UK um, box and there are, are ones available where you can have an address and it will then be forwarded to an electronic mailing service or to a family member, something along those lines, but try and put on the form a UK address that you can get access to anything they send to you, okay? And lastly, the bit of feedback we've had is the turnaround time is circa six to 10 months. Um, that's uh, from somebody that called into the call center. So if you get it in now, um, don't expect an immediate response. There's a big backlog. It's going to take a long time to get through. So again, this is why I'm encouraging you to get early into that queue um, because you know that 2025 deadline will come rolling around before you know it. Okay, that's it on the national insurance contribution. I'm just going to uh, talk now on a few points that are really relevant and that were raised um, by some of the people that wanted to that are on the call. Um, just about taxation on UK pensions, and in particular, again, I'm focusing on South Africa and why it's such a great jurisdiction to retire to. So, look, with most UK pensions, they're tax free going in. When you go to take benefits or payments, those would normally be paid with income tax taken off in the UK. You know, most people. They, they're born in the UK, they stay in the UK, they retire in the UK, okay? You've got access to a 25% pension commencement lump sum that's completely tax-free, but normally the remaining 75% would be subject to income tax rates in the future. You could consider moving it across uh, to a, a, an alternative scheme abroad. Um, some of you might even have these QROP schemes. Uh, they fall fallen out of favor for South African tax residents because of some changes. So if you have a QROP scheme, it's really worthwhile getting it reviewed. I do a lot of this day in, day out on health checks, on, on existing structures. Um, but now since 2017, they'll charge you 25 percent to get of your pension fund to get it out and across to a cure up so they've really kind of died a death from a financial planning point of view um if you however leave it in the uk and draw benefit in south africa once you're a south african tax resident and it's done correctly in the way that we would approach it you will not pay income tax it's exempt under a bit of legislation which i'll talk about in a minute so this is one of the best things Apart from the weather and the wine and all that sort of stuff about re uh, retiring in South Africa, low cost of living, but you could also be in one of the most tax efficient jurisdictions in the world for UK pension income. And that's really the, the reason why we're here uh, day to day to help clients is, is to help them, guide them through all this process. And, th and this is a little bit of the information about what I was talking to. I'm not going to bore you with all the details. Um, this, this bit of the Income Tax Act, it's been around since 1962. Section 101 GC-2. Long story short, you can get your payment as a uh, from an overseas pension of the right type and claim for an exemption under Section 101 GC-2. There's a little bit of work involved. We do it all day, every day. We've got uh, great solutions for this. Um, so if this is something you haven't done already, reach out to us. We can talk you through why it makes sense and 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 how it will uh, work for you going forward. The last little bit I'm just going to talk on is uh, about private pensions for expats. So again, what quite often happens is you've accumulated this pension. Most people forget about it. They don't know where it is, or even if they do, they don't know what it's worth. You know, maybe growing at 1% a year, might be growing at 10% a year. But yeah, you know, where is it invested? What is it actually doing? Who's it with? You know, um, and so that's why I always encourage clients to start with a good understanding of what you have. And, and that's something that we offer as a free service. We I call it the pension MOT. We have a look under the bonnet and we'll tell you, look, this is a good scheme. Leave it alone. You don't need to do anything. It's fine. Or hang on, there's a few points here that you might want to think about. You know, maybe it's a little bit expensive. Maybe the the growth's not good. I, I had a client the other day that we sat down and you know, she's relatively young and and her investment strategy is really, really low risk, you know, and 
And, and that's great if you're you know, 60, 70, 80 years of age, but somebody that was in their 40s you know, should be taking more risk, getting more growth out of their pension. And she had no idea that this problem was brewing and we helped her to fix that for her. The main thing, though, you'll find is that many UK providers don't really want clients who move overseas. There's a lot of administrations, a lot of rules. They'll insist on posting things to you. you know, and if you haven't got a UK postal address, as we were talking earlier, that can be a real problem. You know, and I've seen this countless times where you know, someone passes away and trying to get the uh, pension to the right beneficiaries is a nightmare. You know? So by not having someone they can just pick up the phone and speak to, you know, that makes it really challenging to manage. So, so perhaps, you know, you, what you could consider is looking at an alternative that's managed locally in the jurisdiction you are. So you've got someone like a me that you can shout and scream at if you need answers, you know, and we can guide you through what's happening. And we normally do things like quarterly reviews and, and all those sort of things. So a real human face to your pension arrangements, uh, but keep those pension assets very much in the UK, you know, probably in pounds, maybe in other currencies, but, but in a UK bench space scheme, and if you come to South Africa, doing it tax free as well. And, and that's a lot of the reason you know, that we are so active in this jurisdiction. If you've got lots of little pension pots dotted all around all over the place, one of the things that we do is consolidate those for ease of administration, you know, making sure your risk profile is right, making sure they're the right kind of assets, making sure if you, the worst was to happen to you, that your pension is going to go to your beneficiaries. The way I explain it, it's like swapping a red folder for a blue folder. You know, we, we're very well versed in this, and that's something we can chat about another point. So creating a new UK pension with expat specialists like us. So you know you know what's going on all the time. You're fully up to date with what's going on in the markets. And if you're in South Africa as an example, we'll also try and get that pension income to you when you can get it tax free by the treaty relief. It's all part of the service. So uh, I hope that uh, helps give you an idea. So what is a, a pension MOT? Well, my first question to you now as you've sat here listening, you know, you've got your state pension and we're going to sort that out and get that going. You've got maybe some private pensions dotted around. Okay. Ask yourself this do you know who it's with? Okay. Because who you think it's with and who it's actually with quite often aren't the same. Okay. Pension books get sold and consolidated and homogenized year after year after year. You know, I started off with Aviva, then it gets sold to Royal London, then Royal London sold it to Scottish Widows. It's the story I've heard time and time again. And guess what? They lose touch with you along the way every time that that book is sold. Do you know what your pension is worth today? Okay. Not, not last week, not last year, not 10 years ago. What is it worth today? And if you don't, yeah, maybe what you should do is look at something where you do have that kind of invest, it, it, idea of what it's actually worth. Do you know what it's invested in? You know, what do they actually own? What have they bought for you to fund your retirement? You know, have they bought into the right kind of companies, the right kind of equity, the right kind of bonds, the right kind of alternatives, the right mix for you in your current situation? Or have they just lumped you into the same fund that everybody's got and it's trundling along exactly the same? And if you want to know about it, call the call center. You know, did the coronavirus impact its value? You know, has, has corrective actions been taken to take advantage of this big growth in technology stocks we've seen at the start of this year? Or is it just trundling along, you know, and you don't really know what it's doing for you? And linked with that, this is the most important question. How is it performing against its peers? You know, have you got a racehorse in the race? Or have you got a rocking horse in the race? You know, if you don't know the answers to these questions, absolutely, then I highly recommend that you let us have a look at it um, through our pension reconnection service, because then we can really sort of ascertain what we think it might be worth in the future and whether it's suitable for you. Okay. What do we do? Well, we'll come back to you and we'll do a very, very simple. Uh, to read report. I'm very much a fan of plain English. You know, we don't need loads of technical jargon. We don't need to bore you with all of the ins, outs, and all the rest of it. You know, and we do a red, amber, green scoring. Okay. Very simple. Red is it's bad. There's something that needs to be done urgently. You know, there's a risk to the fund. There's a risk to the funding company. You know, all those kind of real material risks. Amber, it's probably okay, but you might want to think about changing a few things. Green, Leave it where it is. And four times out of 10, we actually recommend that. Just leave it where it is. But 
why not use the service, find out, and then we can then advise you from there. Um, you know, our experts are, are ready to assist you with my team um, and likewise around the world. So that's it, ladies and gentlemen. That's uh, my sort of little uh, overview on the state pension, a little bit about private pensions. And, and uh, if you're a South African or have a South African connection, um, the bonus is, guess what? We can get access to funds tax-free in the future. Um, so why not use it if you're not already? Um, but uh, if you're in another jurisdiction, maybe you're thinking about coming to join us down here where the, the wine is excellent and the views and the weather are great as well. Um, so we're going to move on to the Q&A section now. So let me just stop sharing my screen. I'm going to try and answer those questions as best I can. If you haven't already done so, please just answer. Uh, oh, sorry. Ask a question at the bottom of the screen. Um, it's a very simple button, um, and I'll try and answer them as best I can along the way. Okay, so from our first uh, question here, uh, are you able to assist with those that have uh, moved back to South Africa, um, still have UK workplace pensions, and how better to manage them while being in South Africa? I'm not going to labour the point because I think I've just gone through that in that last section there. Absolutely. Look, just have a pension MOT. Let us tell you whether it's red, amber, green, and then we can talk about some options that may work better for you or not. Like I say, swapping a a red folder for a blue folder. Um, we do it all the time, um, and I've got plenty of uh, clients that I can refer you to to have a chat with to to tell you their experience as well. And uh, you know, like I say, that's that's what we do the majority of the time. Okay. Next question. Moving on. Uh, if I was a uh, expat and I recently moved back to the UK, versus uh, is there a way to do the top up under class two versus class three based on the years being topped up being when I was outside of the UK? Okay, so. So this is a, a, a tricky technical question. Uh, I think you could argue that um, you could fill it in and try for the class twos, because at the end of the day, that's what you would have been able to contribute whilst you're away. Um, but if you're back in the UK now, then you really need to speak to, speak to HMRC because the, the, the rules around that are slightly different. So, so take the opportunity when you're an expat, obviously this is focused on expats um, and, and, and being still outside of the country, um, and probably the best thing would be to just call HMRC and, and like I say, if you can go, go for those class two contributions rather than class three, it's going to save you an absolute fortune. Hopefully that answers your question. Okay, moving on to the next one. Uh, thank you, Greg, for your question. Can the CF83 be used for previous gaps in your NI record when you're aboard or can it be applied, uh, can it only be applied to future payments? Uh, no, the CF83 is designed for filling in these mass missing gaps. Um, for the year. So once you know, you know, I missed 2010, 11, 12, 13, or whatever, there's 10 years of contributions. The CF83 form is what you fill in to be able to, to make those payments. And then you get a reference number from, from HMRC. And when you put the payment in, the payment is linked to that reference number. And that's what then does the top up on your behalf. And then you come back, you check your your um, state pension uh, forecast, and those years will now be showing as, as green. You know, they're topped up, they're, they're good to go. Hopefully that answers your question, Greg. <laughs> Moving on. Um, so, Dave, uh, will pensions, including state and private pensions based in the UK, be liable for tax in the UK? Yes. Yep. Simple as that. The, the, the tax relief you get if you're in the UK um, is when you put the money in. So they encourage you to put money into a pension. OK, you, you grow it tax free and got a bit of tax relief on the way in. But unfortunately, the tax man's waiting at the other end when it comes out. The bit I was talking about for South Africans is that exemption. If you are uh, if you can apply that exemption, you get the, the benefit of tax free in tax free growth and tax free out as well in South Africa. Um, unfortunately, that won't apply if you're in uh, the UK. I hope that answers your question. OK. Moving on, uh, this one's from an anonymous question. Is there an alternative in the case where someone doesn't have a UK address? Will HMRC communicate electronically? Look, I can't speak for them. Um, I would I would like to think that they would, okay? I really can't answer the question because it's not for me to answer. Everything else that the UK government doing uh, is very much focused on electronic communications. Everything's online. The gov.uk website is excellent. It's not like... Uh, some of the systems that we maybe struggle a little bit with here in South Africa, where it can be quite frustrating dealing with the government, relatively speaking. So I would be very surprised if they didn't offer some form of electronic communication on this in due course. But right here, right now, the only thing you can do is fill in that form as an expat and send it in. And then there's that phone number if you really want to speak to them, and that might 
help sort of bridge the gap for now. So hopefully that answers your question. Okay, uh, moving on to Stephen. Uh, I live in Germany now. Who can do the pension MOT for my private pensions in the UK? Um, we'll still assist you with that. Um, so we have a MIFID licensed business for our clients in, um, in Europe. Um, but we will start the process for you and we can help guide you through. And then if it's something you want to explore, then we can introduce you into somebody that can assist you there. I'm a UK qualified um, advisor to UK level four standard. Um, so I do help clients all over the world on various different jurisdictions. So it might even be us or it might be a, a colleague of ours, Stephen. But uh, yeah, so quite happy to assist you there. Um, just give you a bit of an idea on those options uh, going forward. So uh, yeah, feel free to, to reach out to us. Okay, moving on. Well, questions still coming in thick and fast. Um, so I'm doing my best to get through all of them. Uh, do you do the free pension MOT for a, a South African citizen on a work permit in the UK contributing to NI? Um, okay, so in that scenario, um, look, if you if you think you're going to be back in South Africa imminently, quite happy to do it. If you are in the UK, though, and you're likely to stay in the UK, then you need to really speak to a UK based advisor. Again, you know, we can put you in touch with our UK team. Um, the regulations for clients in U the UK um, are slightly different. And, and that's one thing where unfortunately I wouldn't be able to assist with um, because I'm not a representative on our UK licensed business only on the, uh, or predominantly, sorry, on the South African uh, based business. So, um, quite happy to, to put you in touch with guys that can assist you, um, but it's a very different system in the UK around financial advice. Um, so that you know, often have to pay a fee upfront before advice is, is rendered. But again, happy to provide a little bit of guidance to put you in touch with the right business, the right team um, in in those countries where you are. So just reach out to us, and we'll try and guide you as best we can to help you find the right person in our business to help you in the jurisdiction that you're in, um, similar to the previous question. Okay. Moving on, can a family member, a UK citizen who lives in South Africa, use another family member's mail address in the UK for their correspondence? Yes, you can. Simple as that. I do it um, and it works very well. So I highly encourage you to do that. Um, okay, uh, Dave's last question, will, will we now get state pension increases across in SA? Okay, I haven't really touched on this. Um, Again, I was trying to keep it as succinct as possible, but one of the downsides to being an expat anywhere in the world is you don't get an inflationary rise in the state pension when you get it, okay? Normal inflation uh, in developed countries is circa 2 to 3% per year, so it's not a huge amount, um, but it does go up. Um, the last year or two with the sort of post-COVID inflation spike is probably going to carry on forever and ever. We'll probably go back to a sort of lower deflationary kind of picture at some point in the future. But regardless of that, no, it is a, it's a downside of being an expat. Unfortunately, government policy right now is that you get your state pension and it's frozen from there on in. It's a shame. We and other uh, financial advisors like ours have been petitioning for years to the UK government to review that policy because it really isn't fair. Uh, but that's the policy, I'm afraid, Dave. Um, if it changes, we'll let you know as soon as possible. Okay. Um, another question from Dave there. By the way, I'm in SA. So my previous question referred to tax in UK for pensions there while living in SA. You said tax exempt here in SA, but will I pay to, uh, in the UK? Okay, right. So let me just try and sort of put a bit more meat on the bones. So if you have a UK-based pension and you are in South Africa and a South African tax resident, you should be able to apply to get that tax, that income tax-free, okay? If you don't do that process or you don't have the kind of pension structures that we use, okay, what can happen is you will be taxed on an emergency tax code in the UK, all right? So this, again, is one of the reasons why it makes sense to reach out to us. We'll help guide you. There are certain schemes where it's virtually impossible to apply that treaty relief. Um, certain things like crown schemes, um, you know, uh, uh, what I mean by that is military, uh, local authority, police, et cetera. Um, so, you know, it's not always possible. But again, if you reach out to us, we'll be able to give you a bit more of an idea. And then in the very least, we can put you in touch with the providers that can actually go and just do the the uh, tax relief um, applications for you. It's a bit of an exercise between South Africa, SARS and HMRT. It can take a long time as well. I mean, I've seen 18 months, two years go nowhere 
with someone and trying to get that relief form. But once it's in place, then yeah, tax free. Once you've got what's called an NT code, that's what you're aiming for. And then yeah, that income can come out tax free the whole time you're a South African tax resident. Okay, moving on. Um, if I only have three years of NI contributions dating back to the 1980s when I moved to the UK, from what I understand, I'm able to purchase next dating to 2016 at a class two rate of 163. Correct. Yes. Hopefully that answers your question, but only if you get your, uh, yourself moving on this before the deadline in 2025. Okay. Um, and then apologies, question on three-year contributions meant to read. When I moved to South Africa in the 80s, the situations I only have. Uh, okay, so the, the best thing is, again, same process. Go online, national insurance number, get your gateway ID, have a look and see if you're on the system and if you've got any contributions at all. And then have a look to see whether you can add the missing ones. That's really where you're going to get your answer to that for definite. Um, so that's where you start. Same process, but I think no real uh, changes from there. Okay, um, last question then from uh, Greg. Does the pension need to have been paid into an SA bank account to qualify for tax relief? No, nope. I would actually encourage you not to do that. This is again something I do in part of my Getting Financially Fit to Return series um, and helping uh, expats like you. You know, why put it through the banking system um, and lose a huge chunk in, um, in fees, on commissions, on bad rates from the banks honestly they rip a fortune out of it i would have it paid into a uk based pound account and then i would then recommend you move that money or use a debit card or credit card that has a zero foreign transaction fee so something like revolut or monzo or some of the other e-wallet systems very very effective and i know a lot of my clients probably sat there going yeah mark said that to me before you know i'm always on the you know banging on this drum you know to to make sure you've got a really simplistic online uh you know a card like a revolute card is probably the, the one i use anyway why because then when you spend in south africa works on snap scan it works on various things then the rate of exchange is really really close to what's the xe.com rate Okay, if you get more rands for your pounds doing it that way, okay, um, if it has to come into a South African based bank account, fair enough, but put it into a bank account first and then use like a, an FX broker. And we've got a panel of three that are really good. They always beat the banks hands down, you know, and it can add up to a lot. I mean, if you're moving several thousand pounds a month every month, you know, you might find you get almost like another month's worth of income. Yeah, in a typical year by what you would have lost by using the high street banks on the South African and the UK side. So, so again, you know, Greg, if you're not sure, reach out to us and we'll guide you through on a bit of that. Um, it's something that we do as part of our service for, for our clients that we look after down here. Um, hopefully that will make sense. Okay, I think that's the last question. So, wow, well, yeah, 14 questions on that session. So obviously, um, you know, it's of interest. Uh, we will be doing more sessions on this. Um, we will be answering more and more uh, questions, you know, on online sessions like this. We're going to be doing them, like I say, I think every quarter or at least every six months. Um, here's my contact details again. Please so follow us online um, on socials, on Twitter or X as it's now called, on Facebook. I've got a great Facebook page for for um, those looking for advice. If you're in South Africa predominantly, you can connect with me on LinkedIn. Don't hesitate to drop me a WhatsApp or a, or an email. Um, you know, and you're more than welcome to come and see me um, at our offices here in Cape Town. I travel all over Africa seeing clients, um, but these days, as I'm sure you can see, a lot of things are, are done on Zoom. Um, so feel free to reach out to us. I hope it's been worthwhile. If it was, um, please you know, leave us a, a review on Trustpilot if you thought it's worthwhile. Um, and thank you very much for listening. All the best for doing your, your uh, NI contributions. Hopefully, uh, you, by listening to this, you won't be getting your mix in a twist. Have a great day. All the best.